What I'm going to be talking about today in the context of, of sort of the shock of the old is actually the future of death. And a lot of the work I do is on death and dying and technology. Uh, and as a result, I'm always talking, thinking, writing about, researching what exactly is the future of death itself. Now, it's at this point that I need to point out that I grew up in America in a, the great state of Wisconsin. If any of you know the geography of the states, a uh, small town called Hudson, if you'd like to go check it out, uh, and that my father was a funeral director for 35 years uh, in America, at which point now you're all thinking, oh, it all makes sense now. Uh, but actually, it's a much more circuitous uh, route that I went through to become where I am now here in England, working in the Center for Death and Society. Uh, and I actually didn't grow up very much differently than many of you. My life was pretty normal. Um, there were some things that, that were a bit different, such as on Christmas morning, sometimes my mom would have to say to my sister Julie and I, uh, kids will have to wait to open up the presents again this year because someone died last night and dad had to go get the body. Uh, and we'd be like, okay. That's just the way it is. Now, in case you're curious if they had any kind of longer standing uh, impacts on my life, uh, that is a question open for discussion. Um, this is a, a photo of me uh, at age 17 uh, for my high school yearbook. Um, <laughs> A photo I'm quite proud of, actually. Uh, and the important thing to remember about this photo, or uh, to know about this photo, is that there is absolutely no irony in this photo. <laughs> I, I am being totally serious uh, in, in this photo. But nonetheless, smoke machines notwithstanding, uh, I actually, uh, you know, I didn't really grow up in a way that was very much different. But because of the way I did grow up, I'm very comfortable talking about death. Uh, and in some ways, this is something that sometimes my younger sister, Julie, will describe as my superpower. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but nonetheless, it's just something I'm, I'm very fluid and able to discuss in any kind of context. And so, as you're sitting here today listening to the talk, my talk, all the talks, there are two questions I really want everyone to think about. You don't have to answer them right now, and certainly your answers can change. But the first question is, is this. What do you want done with your dead body when you die? Have you thought about this? Do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? Do you want your ashes shot into space? Uh, do you want to be cryogenically preserved for a future that may have no use for you whatsoever? Do you want to be an organ, bone, and tissue donor like myself, which I think is very important? What do you want done to your body when you die? Question two then is, have you explained those wishes to your next of kin? Do your family, your parents, your loved ones, the people around, do they know what you want done when you die? What kind of music do you want played at your funeral, if you've thought about it? What kind of memorialization do you want? What do you want done if you've not had this conversation? Why? Why do you think you're not going to die? How are you going to escape that? And I think it's important to talk about these things because we live in a kind of uh, world in which we often hear, well, death is a taboo topic. It's repressed. We don't want to talk about it. I will tell you right now the exact opposite is true. We hear about and we talk about death every day. What we don't always talk about is our own death. And that's the difference. And that's why I think it's important for us to think about what is our relationship with death, because we see these stories every day in the news. This is one from a couple years, years ago. Redditsboro Council in the Midlands came up with a plan to recycle the heat coming from the crematoria because they have to filter out harmful emissions, particularly coming from mercury and people's fillings in their teeth. They have to filter out the emissions as such so they can recycle the heat, and they're going to pipe it to heat the local leisure center pool. Now, this is not a dead body underneath a pool being set on fire, <laughs> which is what people imagine because it's very evocative. This is a complex technological issue. Now, of course, what happens with these stories is a very similar trajectory. On Monday, when it's announced, there's mass moral outrage and panic, and people are freaking out, particularly on the Daily Mail. And then, by Friday, there's vast philosophical introspection <laughs> about what exactly this means. It's exactly what happened with this. But because we see these stories and because we understand that they involve one thing that's very much a part of our lives, which is dead bodies, it forces us into thinking about, well, what is this relationship between what happens to us when we die, when we become a dead body, and all the things that can be done? But this is a long-standing question that really begins in the first world in the 19th century. So, for example, in the 19th century, toward the mid to late part, we can start to embalm and preserve dead bodies. And the embalming and chemical preservation of the dead body set us on a stage where we're able to make dead bodies suddenly not look particularly dead. 
but also ship them across the country at railways, a whole number of things. But that's just one technology. Another one, the telegraph line. As soon as the telegraph became something people could use, what did they do? They sent out death notices. They sent out death notices to let people know somebody had died. Or they sent out shipping notices saying, I'm sending a body here, please collect it at this port. For all my friends who study social media, I say, you're not studying something particularly new. We've been using tele telecommunications, different kinds of communications technology for a long time on death. Photography was another thing we used quite a bit. It was very common to take photos of dead people, particularly of children, because it might be the only photo of that person you had after they died. And as soon as photography became something we could do, we took photos of dead bodies, in part because they were the best subjects. They didn't move. And while you might think, well, that seems kind of grim, dude, it's true. Long exposure times, you could capture those images. And many families would put these on display. Now, we still do this today. We still take photos of the dead, but we don't put them on display like we did. Now, this is slightly changing. Some of you will be familiar with what happened in the fall and the autumn, which there was a huge internet explosion. It was a Twitter disaster because someone found that young people like yourselves have been taking selfies at funerals and started a Tumblr page called Selfies at Funerals. Uh, to which there was a mass Monday moral outrage about how is it the young people have given up on civilization and by Friday, philosophical introspection about how we're using technology to talk about death. It's exactly what happened here. I would be more shocked if young people weren't taking selfies at funerals than if they were. Why? Because it's the technology you use. And when we think about what happens with technology and what we do, we have to keep in mind there's all kinds of things that can drive people insane when they think about it for too long, right? This is an alkaline hydrolysis machine. It does something called tissue digestion, which is why I don't work in marketing. And what happens is a dead body goes inside of it. It's filled with about 500 liters of water, uh, an alkali, which is a, which is a base, pressure, heat or add. It dissolves all, all organic matter, like your body, producing a kind of Coca-Cola-looking biofluid, breaks down any kind of little bone fragments, and then any inorganic matter is left. Things like fillings and teeth, you collect those for cyclum, right? So what do you do with the biofluid? You send it to the water recycling plant. Or, or, if you think that's crazy, or you could use it as fertilizer. It would be a great fertilizer. Now, most of you in this room are too young to remember the great film Soylent Green, but that's exactly one of the things that was going on in a dystopic 1970s sci-fi film. You should all watch this film, Soylent Green. In part because when we hear these things, you begin to realize, well, you know, you could talk about the dead body as a kind of biomass. We are organic matter. There's no reason you couldn't use a dead body in that way. That doesn't mean you should, but you can. I would suggest to you all we already do this with things like organ donation. That is a form of biomass transfer and something that is a very good thing. So as these technologies evolve and as we think about what is possible with what we can do, we have to keep in mind that one of the main reasons we do this is because we're recycling all kinds of things. It's already possible right now to recycle all kinds of hip implants, knee implants. It happens all the time. Money gets donated to charities. It goes on all the time. My parents both have knee implants. So I look forward to actually, I want, I want those after they're dead uh, and they're cremated. Um, but also, if you want to think about the future future, one of the things that's coming our way is the whole, the whole idea of what can robots do to help us with dead bodies. This is the EATER, the E-A-T-R, the Energetically Autonomous Territorial, Ro Territorial Robot by RTI Robotics. It, it powers itself on biomass. RTI Robotics has a contract with the Department of Defense in America. And when this robot was first released, they were asked by Wired Magazine, so could this power itself on dead bodies? And of course, it was a group of engineers, so they said, well, of course it could. <coughs> Monday, huge outbreak of outrage. Friday, sort of a dialing it back. Like, no, we didn't really mean dead bodies. We just kind of meant a little bit, and more philosophical thinking about what that means. This is a kind of robot we may need in a mass pandemic situation. <coughs> If we humans can't get in there and there are a lot of bodies, we're going to need autonomous vehicles like this, potentially, right? These are the kind of things that the future has with us. Now, one of the reasons we're still thinking about what to do with dead bodies is because we still have cemeteries. And this is an area I work in quite a bit. What is the, what is the future? What can the future be for cemeteries? 
We have a great cemetery here in Bath. Haycomb Cemetery has an open day. The first, <laughs> the first Sunday of June, I strongly suggest you go to the open day. There's a great staff there. It's a, it's a fantastic tour. They have a state-of-the-art cremation system, and you can go on a full tour of it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing place. It's literally right up the road. But because we know we still have cemeteries around here, one of the things we can ask about, well, so what can cemeteries do? This is a cemetery in Spain, just outside of Barcelona. And what the cemetery did is they installed an enormous array of solar panels on the cemetery. Why did they do this? Because they wanted to figure out how can we use solar power in the local community. It was a public-private partnership. At first, there was sort of deep suspicion about what was going on. Then the local council explained, well, we could cover everyone's electricity all around the community, around the cemetery, and everyone said, that's a great idea. Now, why did they install about, it's like about six, or 350 solar array panels in the cemetery? Because they knew it would never be developed. It was going to stay where it was. It's been a very successful kind of plant. Also emerging in cemeteries more and more now, you'll see QR codes. <laughs> and you'll see this down here in the bottom. Um, I actually kind of love these in part because uh, who knows how long they're going to last. Like who knows how long QR codes are going to be around. But you can actually buy a machine that will etch them into the stone now, actually carve them into the stone, and I can guarantee it that future archaeologists are going to find those, and they're going to be like, what the hell are they trying to tell us? <laughs> What is this mythical kind of like, what is this figure? There's something really deep-seated in here. They won't have the technology to read it, of course, but what is it? This is an important point. Cemeteries are vast platforms of technology. Many of them we would think of as being old, but nonetheless, their technology is all the same. So that when we talk about these things, we need to keep in mind we're talking about a shock of the old as much as a shock of the new. A physicist in the autumn was asked a question, he runs a really interesting blog, or she runs a really interesting blog, about at what point will there be more dead Facebook users than living Facebook users, based on current mortality rates and signups? Interesting question. Uh, the projection was 2065. Based on current sign-up and mortality rates, we could have more dead Facebook user accounts than living Facebook user accounts. Facebook effectively becomes an internet grave. And why not? What's going to happen to all those accounts? Now, one of the places I'm working more practically is at Arnest Vale Cemetery in Bristol. Arnest Vale Cemetery in Bristol is a brilliant cemetery. You should all go to Arnest Vale Cemetery in Bristol. It has a, has a great cafe if you're looking for a reason to go there. It's kind of a crazy cemetery. They have all kinds of events, films, things like that. It's on Bath Road. It's been 175 years or so. It's a great Victorian cemetery. Lots of, uh, over 300,000 people have been gone through there in one way or another, usually dead. And I started something there uh, a couple years ago called the Future Cemetery Project. And the Future Cemetery Project asks two questions. It says, it's sort of the two working ideas. We all know that death is in the future. We just want to make the future more visible. And so what we do in this project is we bring together all kinds of artists, creative technologists, and we discuss and figure out what does a future cemetery look like. This is kind of a mock-up. We were trying to be cool one day, <laughs> right? And one of the things we're working on right now, and I'm going to wrap this up by thinking about what this future might be, is video capture and augmentation of a physical cemetery space with different kinds of augmented reality. And so we get actors in studios, we film them, we we dump them into a computer, we digitize it, and ultimately what we're working towards is dropping in actors or people, whomever it might be, into the cemetery space on a server so that when you walk into a cemetery, either with a device you're looking through or the world of wearable computers, things like Google Glass, you will see these people in the cemetery talking to you. I will tell you right now, this will be used for memorialization before we know it. In the same way that, what did people start using Facebook for right away? Memorializing those who died. You could, in theory, put your entire digital footprint into a cemetery. Digital material can be transferred from one way to another, if you want that. But this is the future I'm talking about, right? This is what I'm saying, that when we think about what are the ways we could use this technology, we have a past that's involved in it we've forgotten about, and so when we think about this shocking possibility, we need to recover what has actually gone on to make these things possible. Which brings me back to death. We're all going to die 
at some point. About 1,500 people die a day across the UK. That's the standard number. Now, most of us are going to go on and hopefully live very long lives. But given the fact that we're all going to die, I think it's important that we think about two questions. One, what do you want done with your dead body when you die? And two, have you explained those wishes to your next of kin? Thank you very much. <laughs>